Hello everyone and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. We are here at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, and I am honored to once again welcome to the program Mr. Rick Rule, the founder and former CEO of U.S. Sprott Holdings and the current CEO of Rule Investment Media. Great to have you on the show again. Jesse, it's a pleasure to be back. Thank you for having me. Happy to have you, especially here in person at the VRIC. And I wanted to run through some commodities with you and get your thoughts. We're going to play a game called Bull Case, Bear Case. Um, you are one of the people who taught me that it's always important to have a bear scenario to know what could go wrong. So let's start off with the precious metals, gold and silver. How do you see them currently positioned? Uh, a lot of people, yourself included, have talked about how we are in a bull run for precious metals. What are the main catalysts and tailwinds you're seeing here in 2023, and what could go wrong to derail your thesis? The bull case uh, is really rooted in arithmetic. Uh, gold has done well over millennia when people's confidence in other savings and investment products has been shaken. My belief is that the primary part of the bull case is negative real interest rates, which is to say if you save in conventional instruments after inflation, you lose money every single year. The arithmetic around the U.S. 10-year Treasury, the world's premier savings and investment uh, asset, is instrumental. The U.S. government promises to pay you 3.5% a year in a currency where the purchasing power is uh, being destroyed, according to them, by 7% a year, meaning that you lose 3.5% a year, year after year after year. That's good for gold. Uh, the second part of the case isn't merely the compensation, but rather the credit. The U.S. government owes $32 trillion in on-balance sheet liabilities and over $100 trillion in off-balance sheet liabilities. Things like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, in other words, me. Uh, that debtor is servicing the debt with a deficit that's in, with a budget that's in deficit $2 trillion a year. So you don't get paid to take the risk and the risk grows every single year. The third part of the bull case involves market share. Uh, the precious metals and precious metals equities share of the savings and investment market in the United States is less than one half of 1%, down from a four decade mean of 2%. If debt and deficits and negative real interest rates merely cause demand for precious metals to revert to mean, that means that demand quadruples, which is precisely what I think is going to happen. The bear case is pretty simple, too. Uh, the, first, first part of the, bear, the first part of the bear case is, of course, facetious, which is to say the U.S. government balances the budget. Not in my lifetime, probably not in yours. <laughs> yes, I don't think so. Will interest rates ever go positive? Well, that depends on if they can control inflation. The truth is that the United States in particular is still a hugely diversified, hugely innovative economy. And it could be that the big thinkers accidentally arrange for a soft landing, which is to say that inflation falls below the rate of interest. If that happens, all bets are off for gold. That does not look pretty. I don't think it's going to occur. Uh, I, I do know, however, that in the United States, I live in a culture that's so amazingly innovative that a group of kids can take over a garage in Sunnyvale, California, and out pops Google. So anything can happen. If it, if it occurs that our individual creativity amortizes our collective stupidity, then gold is in trouble. Right. And what about silver? Because a lot of people are looking to silver as more of a industrial metal at this point in time. There's a lot of a narrative behind its use in photovoltaic solar panels and being a part of the push for the new green economy. But of course, it also has a very long history as a monetary metal as well. Do you think silver's role as a monetary metal is shifting towards more of an industrial commodity? Um, and how do you see silver position here? I'm in the middle on that. The truth is that a million, uh, pardon me, a billion ounces of silver a year get used up in industrial processes. Photovoltaics is an example, but increasingly uh, as a germicide in things like uh, pollution treatment, water treatment, stuff like that. So there are industrial uh, applications for silver. In my lifetime, which is saying 45 years as an investor in the silver space, that isn't what's mattered to the market. What's mattered to the market is that silver is the poor man's gold. It has a lower unit value, so more people can participate when the narrative takes hold. 
I'm not interested myself in owning silver for a $2 move or a $3 move. Three times in my life, silver has given me a quantum move, and the silver stocks have magnified the quantum move in the silver. I'm not going to put a huge amount of my net worth in silver because I don't need to speculate at my age with my wealth. But I would love to repeat the last three silver bull markets that I've enjoyed in my career, if I might. The 1970 bull market saw the silver price go from a buck and a quarter to $50. And the move in the silver stocks was more outrageous than that. Coeur d'Alene went from a dime to $65. I'm not suggesting that that kind of move is in the offing now. What I'm trying to say is that a move that's 10% of that magnitude would be very rewarding indeed. So I want to touch on lithium. Battery metals have been trending recently. Obviously, the price of lithium carbonate went up twice last year before coming back down again, but still hovering around levels near the first spike in prices. I'm wondering how you see lithium position because I feel like so much of the thesis behind lithium is related to this electric vehicle revolution, as some are calling it. Now, you've got, of course, as you call them, the big thinkers over in California. They're talking about we need to have only electric vehicles by 2030. The EU has put forth similar mandates. And I personally don't think it's going to play out like the big thinkers think it is. So without the whole EV aspect of it, is there an investment thesis for lithium? And what are your thoughts there? There is an investment thesis for distributed electricity, which is a fancy way of saying batteries. Uh, does it involve electric vehicles? Yes. But more importantly, it involves a billion people on Earth who have no access to electricity and two billion people on Earth who experience energy poverty. So yes, there is an enormous future in the electric metals. My own investment life uh, has taught me that whenever a material is in vogue, whenever it's popular, I should avoid it. And the lithium carbonate price, as you point up, over five years is up by 400%. Many people who failed in the marijuana business, failed in the gold business, failed in the copper business, have restyled themselves now as lithium experts. And whenever I see the lame, the halt, and the blind among the issuers attracted to a commodity, my own suspicion is that the commodity has run. I note, too, that I grew up in a business, the oil and gas business, where lithium was regarded as a waste product. It scaled our productive equipment. We had to pay to get rid of it. Lithium is not in short supply. Lithium processing capacity is in short supply. And if you follow that thesis, where the real money will be made, I don't mean the speculative trading money, but I mean the money in industry, will be made by the big existing lithium producers who merely de-bottleneck their productive capacities. So I'm no longer a lithium player. Okay. Uh, switching to copper, because you're talking about the electrification of the world, um, and a lot of people are talking about copper not only once again towards the shift for the so-called new green economy, but as you point out, a lot of people don't have access to electricity currently still on the earth, and they would like to turn a light switch on. We're seeing the emergence of a, a new middle class in places like India and places like China, other places that are developing. So that all seems very bullish for copper. On the other hand, some people point to the fact that a, a large recession could perhaps bring about demand destruction that could kill the bull thesis at least temporarily. So what is your bull and bear case for copper? Well, you did half the bull thesis, which is to say that the world continues to electrify. Even you, uh, I mean, even people in Western countries who are rich enjoy so much benefit from electrification. Uh, that electrical use, be it electric vehicles or other forms of electrical consumption, will increase. The amount of, elect the amount of uh, copper in an, internal, in an internal combustion engine car grows year on year, not just the electric vehicles. But the real growth in copper will come from 3 billion people in the world who experience energy poverty. Not just the uh, uh, power lines to get them the power, but rather what they do with it once they get it. The other part of the bull case is a bit more complex, which is to say that society has underinvested in copper for three decades. We are living as a species on copper, on copper mines that resemble me. They're 70 years of age, they're past their prime, they're old, they're fought, they're bald. You know, we're living on Chukikamata, 110 years old, Bingham Canyon, 150 years old. 
Grasberg, 60 years old. Escondido, the newcomer, 40 years old. These mines are past their prime. No matter what we do, copper supply is going to fall. No matter what we do, going to fall. The bear case is what you said. It's recession. If we have a global recession, we've been a long time without a recession. If we have a global recession, be the cause interest rates or something else, you can have demand falling, or pardon me, supply falling if demand falls and price doesn't move too. Bear this in mind though, uh, money isn't made in the near term. And investors who want to really, really, really make money, if we see a recession, in the recession when people hate copper, buy it with both hands because the copper mining business is one of the truly great businesses in extractive industries. There is no shortage of copper mines in the world that make a million dollars a day. They are truly special beasts. It's uh, no surprise that Mark Bristow, the CEO of Barrick, said that Barrick's future is copper gold because those are big mines that make big money. Interesting. Um, I want to shift to uranium. That's my favorite commodity, and I think many of the viewers' favorite commodities as well. Uh, obviously, you've spoken at length about the fundamentals and the catalysts that are driving the uranium space right now. Uh, I'd, so I'd, I'd like to get those thoughts again, maybe touching on anything new you see developing that actually strengthens that thesis. And I also wanted to get your thoughts on ANU Energy, the new physical uranium fund out of Kazakhstan that's going to be buying pounds directly from Kazatomprom. Maybe you have some initial thoughts there on how you think that might impact the market. Well, taking them last to first, obviously being the largest shareholder of Sprott uh, and therefore a beneficiary of the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, uh, I, I think our product has advantages for U.S. shareholders. Having said that, I applaud the Kazakhs for um, entering the 21st century financially. The sense that there's off-balance sheet financing and the sense that there's emerging market countries like Kazakhstan that have begun to access global capital markets, I think is a wonderful thing. Because Adamprom, for people who don't know it, is the largest volume, lowest cost, highest profit, I would suggest best run uranium company on the planet. Uh, and I wish I wasn't competing with them, but I am. I think it's good for the uranium space, frankly, not so good for me. Right. Uh, back to uranium itself, I'm not talking my own book quite so much. You know the bullish case for uranium. Uh, if you add all of the costs of production, but importantly, including prior year write downs and cost of capital, the world is producing uranium for something like $60 a pound. And the spot market, they're selling for 50 they're losing $10 a pound about 130 million times a year. Either the price goes up or the lights go out. It's that simple. And increasingly, the price is going up. Uh, so that part, everybody knows. right? Everybody knows. What's changed in the uranium market is two things. For years, I was saying to people, the turn in uranium will come when the pace of Japanese restarts occurs. And I don't know when that's going to happen. Well, now I know. 2023. When, by the way, the recent public opinion polls in Japan have gone from 70% negative to uranium to 65% positive to uranium. And the politicians have always been on the side of uranium in Japan. So the circumstance where they restart, assuming that they fully restart over two or three years, means that new consumption on top of existing production is between 10 and 12 million pounds a year. But more importantly, inventory regarded as held for sale, that is, the uranium that they'd stored that they weren't using, comes off the market. So you reduce supply and you increase demand. The other thing that happened is that there was a huge overhang in the uranium market. There was a boatload of supply. And then we, Sprott, went out and bought 55 million pounds. We don't resell it. We don't use it. Nobody knows the size of the standing inventory around the world, but by some estimates, Sprott bought two-thirds to three-quarters of the float. So the combination of supply coming off market, demand increasing, and the float removed by Sprott, I think is pretty bullish for the uranium price. Risks, two. Recession, big risk. Accident, bigger risk. If you have a Chernobyl, if you have a Three Mile Island, uh, if you have a, you know, a Fukushima, 
uh, you set the Iranian business back 10 or 15 years, and you cut the stocks by three quarters. Right. And do you see, I've, I've heard some people out there say that Kazadamprom or Cameco, particularly when they talk about Kazadamprom, pe some people online say, oh, they could just ramp up production, Cameco could ramp up production, and, and that that would be kind of more of a bearish case for the uranium price. Do you, is it that easy? It's not as easy as just flipping a switch for them, right? Uh, for Kazadamprom, it's very easy. Mm. Uh, this is basically in situ lease production. They increase the injection, they drill water wells, basically. Yeah. They increase the injection of water. They increase stripping. Uh, at mines like Inkai, they could ramp up production very quickly. With Cameco, uh, it's a bit more problematic, but Cameco has spent seven or eight million dollars a month maintaining their shutdown capacity. So over 18 to 24 months, they could increase production too. It's important to note that both companies have said very clearly that they won't resume production until they have long-term offtake agreements at a sufficient price that their shareholders earn a, a reliable and attractive rate of return on capital employed. The Kazakhs have gone further. The Kazakhs have said that to the extent that they sell uranium, a lot of uranium, for less than the total cost of production worldwide, that they are stealing assets from future generations of Kazakhs. Uh, Cameco hasn't said that. Now, it is not uncommon for companies to lie about right. their intentions, and yeah. so it could be that both companies are lying. But my suspicion is that the lie is a fairly attractive lie in the sense that it makes absolute business sense that you wouldn't produce material for less than it costs the industry to produce it. And if that pricing discipline holds, uh, combined, of course, with Japanese restarts and the, by the way, the incredible amount of new build in China, I'm not talking about what the Chinese say they're going to build 10 years from now, but rather what they've permitted, financed, and are in construction on today. Uh, that's very important. People talk about SMRs, small modular reactors. That's going to matter 10 years from now or 15 years from now. What matters today is the, passive, the pace of Japanese restarts and, and the Chinese fuel cycle. That's what matters today. Yeah, China obviously a huge player in the, the nuclear game. They're ramping up. They have a lot planned, but they have a lot under construction right now. Um, and, uh, you know, China General Nuclear there is working with Kazadamprom as well. So I guess one follow-up question there would be, does China have enough uranium to fund or to, to, to provide power to all the plans that they have planned? both in their own country, and I believe they're planning to build several along the Belt Road Initiative new reactors. Where is all that uranium going to come from? The Chinese will have access to it. Uh, Chinese domestic uranium production is small. The Chinese spent an awful lot of money building productive capacity, particularly in Namibia. Very, very, very high cost capacity. But uh, China General Nuclear is a, an amazingly competent com company they will be able to get fuel from Mongolia. They will be able to access re reprocessing capacity in Russia, no matter what the U.S. says. And they will have access to fuel from Kazakhstan, Niger, and Namibia. But the truth is that the Chinese have proven to be very reliable partners in the Iranian business. It might be that Western countries have a problem with the politics in China. But if you are from extractive industries and you have done business with Chinese companies, as I have for 20 years, what you learn is that they're very astute. Uh, and in my own experience in the private sector, they do what they say they're going to do. I suspect that they'll be well treated in the Iranian business because they treat the Iranian business well. Well, let's finish on oil and gas. This is a space I've become pretty passionate about recently. Um, I've spoken with you about it before. It feels to me like a lot of these companies, including the big producers, are paying attractive dividends. They're doing share buybacks, and they're planning to increase both dividends and share buybacks. So it feels like, as you've said before, you're getting paid to wait. Um, however, of course, you know we saw WTI go to over 100, and now it's been hovering around the $80 range. China reopening could be part of that story in terms of bringing on more demand. Um, but you do have some people who are pointing to the fact that, once again, a global recession could bring about demand destruction. So what, what is your bull case and bear case for, for oil and gas? 
Well, the bull case is simply that the market is pricing in the assumptions that emanate from the World Economic Forum. And the big thinkers, you know, the Bidens, the Trudeaus, the rest of those political morons. Right. They would suggest that the industry will reach peak oil demand in 2030. And that's an insanity. It's a true insanity. It's uh, an amazingly efficient fuel. And my suspicion is that peak oil demand occurs in 2045, 2050, and then declines gradually from there. Uh, I think we'll be making money in the oil business for 70 years. And so the terminal values that are assigned as a, on a net present value basis to reserves are way, way, way overstated. Way overstated. What you say in terms of return to capital share return of capital to shareholders is true and in some cases beneficial. It's important that investors not measure oil stocks by dividends though. It's important that you buy companies that are making enough sustaining capital investments that they can maintain production. Mercifully, there's a lot of those. We have an odd situation where governments are asking companies to produce more to bring gasoline prices down while they're saying to them, we're gonna put you out of business in 2030. Yes. So Biden has asked Chevron to invest billions of dollars, which he will then steal from them in eight years. Right. And Chevron has responded as one might expect that they would um, by increasing the pace of a return of capital to shareholders. It's odd that the political class, in their brilliance, uh, has oddly made the oil and gas business an extraordinarily good investment from my perspective, not their intention, but in fact, the result, the bear case. Oh, I should say one more thing just for fun, just to get your viewers mad at me. Yeah. You know, many of your viewers are probably on the alternative energy bandwagon. And alternative energy has been good to me. I've financed it for a long time. On a global basis, we have now spent $4.6 trillion on alternative energies. And we've reduced the market share of fossil fuels from 82% to 81%. We've reduced it 1% for a $4.6 trillion expenditure. How much money would it take to take the market share of oil and gas down to 75%? There isn't that much money in the world. The bear case, uh, a recession. That's the entire bear case. No amount of government stupidity can overwhelm the arithmetic. Government can and will make it more expensive to produce oil and gas. They are jawboning the biggest institutional investors in the world not to invest in oil and gas. They're jawboning the banks not to lend to oil and gas. They're jawboning insurance companies not to insure oil and gas. I'm in the insurance business. I'm insuring oil and gas. <laughs> the fact that the great big guys walk away and leave opportunity for Rick is, I mean, for once in my life, I owe the politicians thanks. My new bank, Battle Bank. When the big banks in the world walk away from the oil and gas business, little old Battle Bank we're going to be there like white on rice, uh, like crazy. And when the biggest institutional investors in the world walk away from one of the best investments in the world, the little investors need to say, thank you. Yes, absolutely. That Very succinctly put, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space still moving forward. Uh, and it was great having you on today. Before I let you go, could you let our viewers know where the best place to find you online and talk a little bit about your uh, portfolio evaluation service yeah, you I'll offer? Give, I'll give you an incentive. Uh, if you like what I have to say about natural resources and you want to hear what I have to say about your natural resources, go to my website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. List your natural resource stocks. Please no crypto. Please no pot stocks. Please no tech stocks. Just stuff I know about. I'll rank them personally, one to ten, and I'll comment on individual issues if I think my comments have any value. In addition to that, uh, I want to talk to you about my new bank. If you'd like to borrow against precious metals, uh, or you'd like to bank with a bank that pays in the top quartile of deposit payers nationwide, think Battle Bank. When you go to Rural Investment Media in the question and comment section, write bank. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rick. Thank it you, was Jesse. great talking to you, and we'll have to have you on again to continue the conversation. Look forward to it. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.